Welcome to our continuing 2018 educational webinar series. I am Catherine Short, Partnership Marketing Specialist for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have with us today, Dr. Jonathan Fialkov, president and founder of Rational Surgical Solutions, LLC. Dr. Jonathan Fialkov is a urologist in West Des Moines, Iowa, with Hi. over 15 years of experience. Dr. Fialkov was born in East London, South Africa, and moved to the United States when he was seven. He spent his formative years in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and attended Allegheny College in Meadville, Pennsylvania, where he graduated with honors. He completed his medical degree at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and went on to complete a residency in ur urological surgery at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. Dr. Fialkov has conducted numerous research studies and presented at regional, national and international conferences on multiple occasions over the course of his career. Dr. Fialkov is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, meaning his education and training, professional qualifications, surgical competence, and ethical conduct has passed a rigorous evaluation and has been found to be consistent with the highest standards established and demanded by the college. Dr. Fialkov's extensive experience in his field and the health industry gives him profound insight into the problems that exist in the healthcare space today, as well as an extensive network to whom promulgate his products. A copy of the slide deck is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions in the question box on your control panel during the presentation. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Your PACOM CEU certificate will be emailed to you from PACOM following the broadcast. There is no need to request it. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. A download of the handout should be available with the button on the bottom right hand of your screen. Dr. Fialko, a warm welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction, um, and thank you all for joining me today uh, for the webinar. Um, my talk is entitled Building the Bridge, and we're going to be talking about using digital media in patient education and informed consent to break communication barriers between patients and doctors, doctors and software developers and healthcare IT, patients and their data, and patients and healthcare IT. So I'm going to start by discussing uh, patient-centered care, and a, a seminal paper was published in 2001 in the British Medical Journal, which was a report by the Institutes of Medicine, uh, and that report was entitled Crossing the Quality Chasm, um, hence, hence the title. Uh, the focus of this paper was on patient-centered care. Uh, this was really a novel concept in healthcare to to really change the focus from the healthcare team and the disease state to the patient's uh, preferences, needs, and values, and to really utilize the patient's view of their illness and their situation as a whole to guide the appropriate treatment for their healthcare condition. So, to take a step back, uh, Part of patient-centered care is the concept of shared decision-making. What shared decision-making consists of is patient education plus the conversation, two-way communication between the healthcare team and the patient and families, and the concept of informed consent. So we're going to get into informed consent a little bit later on in the talk, but I just wanted to really show you how it was a, a, an instrumental part of the shared decision-making process. So in order to really engage patients 
in their own care, we need to give them the opportunity to uh, to choose uh, the various options after they've been educated and to also bring in their families and, and caregivers into this process. In order for this to work effectively, uh, the patients and the family need to have resources and need to be educated about their illness, about the various treatment options, and the implications of those treatment options. Now, shared decision-making differs from informed consent in that shared decision-making is really focused on the needs of a particular patient, that individual that's sitting with the physician or the healthcare team who is discussing what treatment they may need in the future for their particular, in, their particular uh, medical problem, given their situation, in, uh, and this could be from a healthcare, situa a healthcare standpoint, but also from the standpoint of uh, their social, uh, social situation. Uh, what are their uh, resources and support, and what is their support network like? So when we talk about shared decision making, this is this involves a conversation, as mentioned before, and it's a two-way conversation. It's not a clinician telling the patient and the family this is what needs to happen. It's the clinician presenting relevant options and then the patient articulating back to them what really matters to them and which options would be acceptable. Informed consent is a process which establishes a minimal legal standard for permission to proceed with the treatment and is relevant for all people like that patient. So everyone who has that illness or everyone who has that health condition um, rather than this specific patient. And that's, I think, a very key differentiator between shared decision-making as a concept and informed consent, which, as I mentioned before, is a part of shared decision-making. So why I'm why I started with shared decision making as an important aspect of patient centered care is that there are implications for reimbursement and delivery of care. Already, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services is mandating a shared decision making process for certain procedures like implantation of an automated implantable cardiac defibrillator, um, lung cancer screening with low dose computed tomography and a cardiac procedure, left atrial appendage closure for stroke, pro, stroke prophylaxis in patients with atrial fibrillation. Now, one of the requirements for a truly uh, effective shared decision-making process is you need decision aids. And decision aids could be pamphlets, they could be video, they could be models, um, they could be a website. And that's really one of the issues which has come up in the shared decision-making requirements for CMS, is, and that is that decision aids aren't widely available that meet the criteria established by CMS. Uh, there was a study done recently, the American Hospital Association survey, which showed that 70.8% of patients reported using decision aids. However, on follow-up, what, what many hospitals were calling decision aids were, in fact, not decision aids. They were information about what to wear for surgery or um, really information about uh, wh where to show up for your surgery, that type of, of practical information which really didn't contribute to the decision-making process. Uh, based on the, the lack of resources, the National Quality Forum uh, has created guidelines for decision aids and is actively trying to, uh, to encourage various organizations to produce decision aids. Again, it's still a slow process and there isn't much out there. So shared decision making as a process involves inviting patients to participate, engaging patients in their care, presenting options, and as part of the discussion, providing information. Again, that's where the decision aids come into play. And then assist the patients in evaluating these various options based on the individual patient's goals and concerns. Furthermore, 
The process should facilitate deliberation and decision making. It should not put patients under stress. There shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a set time uh, limit to make a decision. Uh, patients should have the resources, time, and support they need to make a decision and then follow through on that decision once it's made. Now that's all. That's the ideal situation. In reality, there are a lot of pressures on healthcare providers, on patients, on healthcare systems, and one of them, believe it or not, is technology. Technology can be an obstacle for the individual and for the healthcare team and system as a whole in delivering patient-centered care. One of the major obstacles, one of the major technological obstacles in patient and shared decision making and engaging patients in their care have actually been electronic health records. Um, electronic health records are now mandated uh, under uh, CMS rules and virtually every healthcare provider, healthcare system, as, as you're aware, um, follows those, uh, those requirements and, and um, again, uh, have implemented electronic health records. What in, in polls, uh, multiple polls actually uh, from various organizations, including the American College of Physicians, um, American Medical Association, and even some that have been uh, performed by the electronic health record vendors themselves have shown that there have been issues with electronic health records meeting their promise of interoperability and engaging patients in their care. Um, in fact, 14% of providers, only 14% of providers share data electronically outside their organization. There are many firewalls which have been built um, for security, but also to for a healthcare system to control their data uh, from an, an econo for an economic reason um, that interfere with uh, patient engagement and the ability to effectively uh, deliver care and, and again, uh, facilitate that shared decision-making process. Um, secure messaging is a mandatory uh, feature for electronic health record systems and patient portals, which are a part of those. And, only 30% of physicians act, actually use the secure messaging feature. Furthermore, 24, only 24% provide patients with the ability to view, download, or transmit health records. So there is many, many promises made for EHRs which have not yet been fulfilled. And uh, that can have implications for patient satisfaction and patient outcomes. Uh, this is a very interesting study from 2015 done in a family uh, medicine clinic affiliated with the Veterans Administration Hospital where they looked at electronic health record use and patient satisfaction. And uh, what they found is that basically the more time the physician spent entering data on the electronic health record and the less time the, patient, the physician spent actually looking and interacting with the patient, the worse the uh, patient satisfaction scores, and the patient's overall impression of the quality of the care they were receiving. With more and more pressure on healthcare providers, uh, both uh, mainly economic uh, pressures, to provide high-quality care that meets, uh, that, that meets uh, patient satisfaction benchmarks, uh, and yet also to be able to uh, generate revenue for an organization or for, uh, or for the individual uh, practitioner, um, this becomes a real challenge to, to actually meet all of those requirements for the electronic health record and to be in compliance for, for billing at the maximum level, and yet be able to provide an experience for the patient that, meet, that is satisfactory. So overall, you can see there's, there's a lot of uh, pressures on the physician. The electronic health record has certainly contributed to this. And uh, again, there have been multiple surveys done. This was the most comprehensive, uh, published in uh, August 2015. Uh, there's another uh, survey which uh, has not yet been released by these same organizations. And uh, but this 2015 survey showed that uh, there was quite a bit of dissatisfaction by the healthcare providers with current electronic health record uh, systems, uh, with 42%. Uh, found that their uh, EHR system actually uh, affected efficiency in the office. 72% um, actually felt that it was increasing their workload. 
54% found that EHR increased their total operating costs, and in fact, 43% had not yet uh, been have not yet been able to return to their pre EHR implementation productivity levels. All of these issues is contributing to the problem of physician burnout. Uh, this has been uh, actually in the popular uh, media uh, recently. Um, and of course, burnout of physicians has implications for patients. And so I think this is why, uh, this is why it's been uh, featured more in, uh, in, in the uh, popular media. So what the studies have shown with regards to EHR's effect on burnout is that approximately 50% of physicians suffer from burnout. And studies have also shown that the burnout affects patient outcomes and interactions. And in the largest study, uh, which was published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings and actually uh, was uh, conducted by Mayo Clinic uh, internal medicine physicians, uh, revealed that uh, of this large study, those physicians who were tasked with uh, sort of bureaucratic tasks like computer physician order entry as part of the mandatory use of EHRs were at higher risk of professional burnout and were actually more likely to reduce hours or leave the profession of medicine. That's of, of key importance because the American Association of Medical Colleges projects that there's already, even with the existing um, number of physicians in practice, a physician shortage of 100,000 plus by 2030. So we have an upcoming crisis from a workforce standpoint that's only getting worse based on this technology and again, while we've been focusing on the physician side, the provider side of uh, the barriers that technology creates, obviously, if you don't have providers to provide the care, um, shared decision making uh, will not work. Now, patient portals are an important mandate for all of the electronic health records currently in use. And studies have shown that patients want to use uh, patient portals, want access to their information. Um, the majority of U.S. adults use the Internet, uh, even older adults, uh, the majority are using the Internet, and the majority of seniors are accessing it on a, on a, a smartphone, um, as are the majority of, of uh, adults overall. Um, those who, aren't, uh, who don't have a smartphone, 81.5% per, like of, of seniors in the United States have access to a device to access the Internet. Now, some of the challenges that patient portals um, can result in the current the current standard patient portal, which I'll show you an example of in just a second, is that uh, English as a second language uh, can be a barrier in utilization of those portals with uh, Latino and Filipino users in this study um, having difficulty in using the internet less than others uh, due to language. Um, with regards to the age issue, uh, this is a, a typical patient portal. Uh, this is actually a relatively new updated patient portal for a major healthcare uh, organization in the United States. And you can see it's not really optimized for mobile, whereas I mentioned before, the majority of uh, individuals in the United States are getting their healthcare information. It's got small type and um, it isn't really focused for the individual patient. This is more for a patient for a patient to use as a as a reference, but again, it doesn't give them any guidance in what's the most appropriate information for them. So, again, multiple issues with the the current system from the standpoint of utilization by the physicians, access to information by the patients, quality of information available to the patients. And even more concerning is that electronic health record systems may have issues with information integrity. The information that's available may not be accurate. And, and this is due to uh, electronic health record system design flaws, problems with system usability, inappropriate documentation capture, a lot of use by healthcare professionals to copy and paste because of the time constraints and the, and the innate difficulty of entering new data in these systems. Uh, utilization of templates which have not been approved, and then uh, clinical decision support systems, which actually may contribute to errors rather than uh, rather than help with errors. So even if patients have access to this information, in some cases it's inaccurate. This can lead to malpractice claims, and this is a study by CRICO, which is Harvard's Risk Management Foundation. They 
reviewed malpractice claims related to electronic health records. This is from 2016. And what they found was that the majority do occur in ambulatory care settings, but there's a variety of issues related to uh, the malpractice claims. And many of them are related to user-related user issues, um, as mentioned on the previous slide. Some are also technology-related issues, such as system malfunctions and design issues, as well as uh, failure of alerts and decision support. So we, we're talking about challenges with healthcare technology as it stands. We're talking about a, a process to improve healthcare called shared decision-making and how the technology issues are interfering with the ability to really optimally deliver the shared decision-making model. So some of the challenges that physicians are facing as a result of, the, uh, of these, conflicting, um, these conflicting issues are medical malpractice claims, which has been shown in other studies to uh, affect practice and increase costs in healthcare systems. Taking, taking those additional costs out of, the, out of the picture and just talking about the actual amount spent by insurance companies to defend malpractice claims and the impact that, again, problems with the EHR, problems with physician with communication, and problems in delivering care can lead to $6.4 billion is actually spent annually defending these malpractice, cl malpractice claims. 42% of the claims were due to communication factors. And if you just separate the communi communication factors in this study over a three-year span at, at the Harvard hospitals, they incurred $264 million in malpractice payouts. So obviously, communication is very important for multiple reasons, to improve care, to maintain, to manage cost, but also at the bottom line, to protect the institution and the physician from liability. Challenges to properly communicate with patients. And again, this is all ties into the shared decision-making model with regards to patient to this two-way conversation and to the education component. Um, challenges are in education. Uh, how, what, what resources are available? We mentioned a lack of decision aids in the shared decision-making model. How do you get patients engaged? There are other issues from the standpoint of patient safety. Uh, is the solution is there a solution out there which is going to improve patient safety, which is going to protect the physician mal from malpractice, improve doc by improving documentation, and developing and or maintaining the doctor patient relationship, and by addressing patient safety, can we improve outcomes and either maintain or increase revenue? Well, this is these have been difficult challenges, and there really up until recently have not been a lot of great solutions. Now with with some of the negatives of technology, there are also opportunities. And that's what we're gonna talk about in just a moment. So we mentioned informed consent way back at the beginning of the discussion. And we're gonna go back into it a little bit more. As we, as we mentioned before, it is part of the shared decision-making model of care. Informed consent predates the shared decision-making concept. Uh, in fact, shared sure, decision-making was first uh, enshrined in case law in 1847. What it is, is obtaining permission before conducting a medical sur or surgical intervention on a person. It's mandated by law, as mentioned before. Uh, in a, in the next couple of slides, we're going to go over the values of informed consent, why it's valuable, but also the process itself, what's involved in it. The current process are to first a face-to-face paper-based discussion for the most part, where the physician's notes are the only record of the discussion. This can lead to malpractice claims mainly through the issue of mismanaged patient expectations and underestimation of patient comprehension. And a major issue with the informed consent process as it's currently delivered is that patients only recall 20 to 30% of what they're told, even minutes after the informed consent discussion is administered. So why informed consent is such an important aspect of the shared decision-making model and why it's so important overall for the proper delivery of healthcare has been described well by the Joint Commission. 
the Joint Commission has listed these reasons and these, and these goals of informed consent. It's, of course, to help patients make informed decisions, it's to strengthen the therapeutic relationship, improve pre- and post-operative care, it's to engage patients and their caregivers, enhance patient safety, save money by averting delayed and canceled surgeries, and, as mentioned before, decrease the likelihood of lawsuits. The informed consent conversation is quite extensive, or at least the way it should be delivered as described by the Joint Commission, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and many other organizations, including the Institute of Medicine. So during the discussion, the diagnosis should be covered, the purpose of the procedure, nature of the procedure, risks associated with the procedure, anticipated benefit to the patient, possible alternatives, very important to discuss the risk of doing nothing, and then a detailed description of what the recovery will involve after the intervention. Now, informed consent can be done for surgery. It can be done for vaccination. It can be done for initiation of uh, any type of a high-risk medication, chemotherapy, for example, or even imaging studies where there's some risk of, uh, of a, an adverse outcome um, during the uh, diagnostic, uh, diagnostic study. So this is a process which is done hundreds of thousands of times every day uh, across the United States. Part of this ties into, as I mentioned before, patient safety and risk management, which is a major focus of the Joint Commission. And these are recommendations that we give our clients uh, our health, particularly the healthcare professionals, uh, about managing patient safety and the benefits of informed consent. And again, all of this ties again ties into this overarching concept of shared decision making. It's important when any education or discussion is conducted that health literacy is taken into communication into uh, consideration uh, that a teach back technique or a way to confirm patient comprehension is engaged during a discussion and that resources, appropriate resources are utilized to truly educate the patient about the upcoming intervention. There are obstacles even to these simple recommendations. English is a second language, as I mentioned before, as an issue with patient portals. Uh, are, is an ongoing issue uh, in the United States and is actually now the number one cause of medical malpractice suits in the United States. English is a second language. Physicians love to use jargon. Even when we try not to, we use jargon. So that becomes an issue in properly conducting an informed consent and shared decision-making discussion. W what is the individual, the patient, or the family member's education level? And what type of healthcare literacy do they have? Um, with an aging population and, and more um, and, and more exposure now to, uh, to memory issues, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, etc., um, it's very important to assess uh, the patient's intellectual ability and memory. Patients with, who are hard of hearing and visually impaired may have issues in comprehending the discussion. And of course, there's natural reactions to stressful situations of having a discussion uh, with a physician or with a healthcare professional. And again, the, the educational resources are lacking. Finally, there are more and more time constraints on physicians. In order to address all of these challenges, uh, there, we at Rational Surgical Solutions uh, developed a new standard to educate patients, engage them in the decision-making process, engage their family members, and meet all of the informed consent and shared decision-making criteria. Um, recognizing the needs uh, within healthcare, recognizing an increased emphasis on shared decision-making, uh, the value of informed consent, and not finding resources out there, uh, we actually had to develop this in order to fulfill a need of, of uh, clients and patients. So what we found through our, through our market research and through discussions, you know, I'm, I'm a, cl a clinician, discussions with my colleagues across the country uh, and patients and families, 
is that they there was a, an eagerness and a, and a hunger for high quality uh, patient education. Um, multiple studies have shown that video is the most effective way to communicate with patients. Uh, we also discovered that there were issues with documentation, with um, inadequate uh, written and text-based resources for patients, and also, quite frankly, uh, most of it being on paper, which is easily lost. And then there was also a request, um, which was felt to be very, very important by most of the uh, most of our patients and their families to have access to this material, not just at the time of a consultation or a discussion or, or a hospital visit, hospital stay, but rather to have that available before and after the consultation and to have supplemental educational material about tasks that the patient and the family were going to uh, have to engage in as part of the care process. So I mentioned uh, just briefly the value of video in educating patients um, about procedures. Um, one of the best studies, a recent study from 2016, looked at using a tablet device with uh, a video of a urologic procedure uh, versus a standard verbal communication. And they were able to document in this uh, in this trial, uh, which is a which is a, a crossover uh, design, that patients actually had improved understanding when they used a port what they call portable video media, or essentially a, a video on a on a tablet device, versus those who had uh, the standard verbal communication or the the standard informed consent discussion. And even in crossover, there was an increase in their knowledge score. Uh, but from the standpoint of patient preference, patients actually preferred uh, watching a video than uh, compared to speaking to a physician. So of course, it's important that they have the opportunity to ask questions and speak to that physician. Um, they, they found the, uh, put the actual video on the tablet device to be more useful. Another interesting study looking at Giving patients and families resources at the time of discharge is the Good to Go program. This is a Robert Wood Johnson funded program that was done at the Coleman Regional Medical Center in Alabama, uh, where they were attempting to reduce 30 day readmission rates uh, using a program where the nursing staff at discharge could record their teaching instructions for the patients and their caregivers, which could be accessed through a uh, toll-free phone number or on a secure website, they were able to realize a 15% decline in readmission rates and a 58% increase in their patient satisfaction scores using the system. So providing those type of uh, resources has a market impact on the bottom line and, of course, on patient uh, outcomes and the quality of their experience. We looked at those type of experiences in designing what we call the Ratify Informed Consent System, which is a point of care system that uses a tablet. Uh, we actually use the iPad, uh, the Apple iPad device to educate patients uh, at the office and capture uh, the discussion between the healthcare team and the, the patient and also handle documents. So any signatures can be done on the iPad device. We also created a patient-facing website, a patient portal called the Patient Care Site, uh, where patients can access all this information before and after their visits. Now, we track and audit all of their interactions with the system, so the care team is aware of how the patients are engaging with the platform. Uh, these are a couple of uh, screenshots from the patient uh, care site. You can see it's it is optimized for mobile. It's very easy to read, very clean, and easy to navigate. Um, patients are able to learn about procedures, about their disease state uh, and diagnosis before they meet with the doctor, and then have those resources which they can share uh, with family members securely uh, anytime before or after the visit to make sure that the, uh, the support network is really on board with that patient to, so that they can have a, a, a smooth post-operative course and, um, and a good experience overall with good outcomes. Again, uh, 
we use a checklist type of a, a an approach with all of the different um, aspects of care and patient engagement um, featured at the top there. The patients can learn about their upcoming procedure. They can prepare. They can engage uh, in, which is uh, the process where they uh, really learn about the actual procedure and what to expect afterwards. And then review allows them to uh, go back and even watch the encounter uh, if it was recorded between between that patient and the healthcare team uh, as a resource. And also they have the secure messaging um, feature as well built in. We, uh, with the system, we, we were able uh, in our initial pilot to demonstrate a market improvement in patient satisfaction scores and efficiency. So if you look at the uh, at the graph on the left, uh, the five five physicians there used the Ratify system, used digital media on our platform. Uh, the ones on the right, three physicians did not. This was over 500 patient encounters, and this was this is a measurement using the Press Gainey um, validated instrument for patient satisfaction. And these results are in the education domain, though we saw a similar pattern in the overall patient satisfaction scores. And what you can see is over a six-month span, those physicians that used digital media on our system, the Ratify system, uh, were able to increase uh, their percentile rank versus peers in the Prescani instrument. Now, that was not uh, – that we had tried multiple other, uh, multiple other um, strategies before this including care coordinators and uh, brochures, uh, sort of old standbys, and weren't really able to make much of a difference. And essentially that's on the, on the right side, the three physicians actually saw no improvement or a decrease in their patient satisfaction scores. Now on the right, um, you can see the time reduction. And so this is for typically short in-office uh, procedures. And what you can see there is there was a substantial decrease in the time the physicians actually spent with the patients, and yet the patient satisfaction scores went up. And so this efficiency, um, driven by the use of the digital media on, on, a, on the appropriate platform, was able to improve efficiency so physicians could see more patients and generate more revenue uh, in the same amount of time uh, during the day, and yet still provide a high-quality experience for the patients. So. We have now expanded to, to some other centers, and what I'm showing you here is the patient feedback from our internal survey. We ask two questions um, uh, after patients engage with our system, and those questions are how easy is it to use the Ratify system? Um, and the next question is how useful is the video education in making your decision? Uh, what we found is on a scale of a Likert scale of one through 10, Approximately 94% of patients, uh, excuse me, 96% of patients gave us a 9 or 10 out of a scale of 1 through 10 with how, how easy it was to use the system. So we wanted to make sure that what we were delivering to patients and the way we were delivering it to them was going to be accessible, uh, that we were going to address the English as a second language issue, that we were uh, going to meet all of the uh, standards in user de user interface design to uh, enhance the patient's experience and, and provide a vehicle for educating them so that that informed consent decision, informed consent discussion as part of the shared decision-making process is going to be effective. When you look at how useful the video education is, it's about 83% gave us a 9 or 10 on that scale of 1 through 10. So patients really are, are finding video education to be very useful, hence the improved patient satisfaction scores on the Prescani. And in fact, if you look at all of the uh, patients who, uh, the entire population of patients, less than 5% gave us a score of five or less, indicating that they didn't find it useful. So overall, people are, are uh, patients and their families are embracing uh, digital media, particularly video, as an effective source of patient education. So uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to conclude the discussion, and then um, as 
mentioned before, we'll, we'll take some questions. So in, in conclusion, shared decision-making and informed consent are increasingly being emphasized as drivers of healthcare quality and efficiency. And this uh, initially was just a suggestion, a recommendation, but now they're actual um, implications for not doing a shared decision-making process, at least in, in three procedures, there's discussion to increase these uh, requirements in other procedures, including um, joint replacements and orthopedic surgery and, and other major surgeries, uh, cardiac surgeries, uh, cardi and cardiology procedures, et cetera, et cetera. So this is going to be a uh, going to be an ongoing um, process that physicians and, and patients are going to be encouraged to engage in, and there are going to be financial uh, rewards and and uh, also financial uh, penalties for not engaging in those going down down the line. Um, as we talked about before, health information technology creates barriers to communications in some cases and to patient care, um, and we need to overcome those because, again, the shared decision-making is very important. Up until recently, the technology has really not been available to address that. I mean, video has been available online for a long time uh, through uh, outlets like YouTube, but there has been no way to really track patient engagement with those resources or to target those resources to patients. And now with um, with mobile technology, with uh, applications uh, such as the Ratify system, we're able to actually target patients with the appropriate information to get the optimal benefits out of these different decision aids and uh, digital media tools. It's important to activate patients at, the, at a mandatory point of engagement. What we discussed earlier was that informed consent is legally mandated. Uh, patient engagement has been a hot a hot button word for uh, uh, several years now. It's sort of I think there's some fatigue using it. It's been unfortunately very unsu unsuccessful um, with as I as I showed in the slide before patient portal use. Only about 24% of patients are actually um, utilizing them. Um, much of that is that the physician, the uh, healthcare team and system aren't necessarily pushing it in the right way, but also the patients don't have much of an incentive to engage in it. But if it's mandatory, uh, then they have no choice. They have to engage in their care. Uh, studies have shown that patients respond better to video. It crosses boundaries. We can address uh, education levels. We can address um, English as a second language through translated videos. And given all of this information and what we know about digital media, what we know about patient engagement, and about the incentives and initiatives for patients to be better educated, to participate in their own decisions. Um, the Ratify system really, and our data reinforces that, in fact, uh, this does appear to be an effective approach uh, to, to engage patients and, and educate them as preparation for shared decision making. And at that point, uh, I will conclude and we'll uh, take questions. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so we did have some questions that came in, and the first one had to do with um, with uh, a question and having to do with the uh, conclusion there. So um, how does shared decision-making and a standardized process for informed consent improve outcomes and manage cost? So uh, how does this process actually, actually improve outcomes? Um, you know, studies have shown that patients who are engaged in their own care uh, have a decreased readmission rates, decreased unplanned visit rates to the physician after an intervention, and have fewer complications through uh, by improving patient safety. Um, uh, those are the uh, you know sort of financial benefits from the standpoint of, of benefits which can't really be measured. Uh, patients, uh, there are studies which show um, that patients have uh, a better experience, and you know the patient satisfaction scores, which are being which have become so important for Medicare reimbursement. About two percent of Medicare reimbursement is is tied to patient satisfaction scores, 
and uh, you know physician loyalty uh, as well. So the loyalty to the healthcare team and and um, the desire to come back to that to the that system or that individual uh, healthcare provider for their for their ongoing care uh, can be impacted uh, by a, a positive shared decision making and informed consent process. Okay, great. Um, also, uh, can this technology help patients that have a questionable decision-making capacity, such as uh, dementia, for example? Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the, the issues that many clinicians, many clinical uh, healthcare providers would, would tell you they run into is patients who nod and smile and say they don't have any questions and understand everything, but then later find out the patient really didn't comprehend what was being discussed with them. And with a system like the Ratify system, or actually a teach-back system, which is very labor-intensive but does not require any technology, um, these ac uh, part of the point of those is to confirm comprehension. And um, actually, we can, through, through our system, uh, provide um, cognitive assessments to confirm that the patients are, are, are able to, to legally make those decisions. Also, it's important to have healthcare providers uh, or healthcare, uh, um, sorry, have the patients, uh, patients' families and caregivers uh, involved in the discussion with the healthcare providers because uh, they, having an extra set of ears there, even if the person is, doesn't have dementia, has you know, normal cognitive function, uh, just to be able to process that information and serve as a resource. Uh, with the ability to record and with providing resources targeted to that individual patient, um, you know, we have, they have resources even if they don't have that individual available with them at the consultation. Right. Yeah, it's, I could see, and, and especially if it's a very stressful situation and it's, it's good to have another set of ears and, and eyes as well. It's crucial. Right. So we had another question. Uh, with healthcare uh, data breaches uh, frequent in occurrence, what security measures are in place? Yes, yeah, so uh, what we have done with our Ratify system is developed it using the Microsoft Azure Cloud. Um, the cloud computing and using uh, the cloud to store patient data uh, is actually much safer than uh, hospital systems or individual physicians storing data on their in their own data center. Um, also, everything, uh, any type of patient uh, information, any PHI on our system is encrypted uh, and uh, removed from the point of care device that the patient would be using in the doctor's office if it were to become lost, for example. But I, I think the new the newest uh, developments in uh, data storage that the cloud provides, as well as access um, that using cloud computing provides, is going to be a model for healthcare um, information, for health information technology going forward, and including uh, digital media. Um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me to ha see, uh, you know, even a, a com company like YouTube uh, to come up with a medically, uh, you know, a HIPAA compliant platform, um, you know, at, at some point. Right, right. Good. Uh, okay, so we have another question here uh, having to do with that. Um, can this system communicate with EHRs? So we have a lot of people asking that. Yes, um, it's critical that any type of technology, particularly that's involved in informed consent, uh, is able to send information at, to electronic health record. At the very least, there needs to be a unidirectional communication to send signed documents and to send signals essentially to the HR that yes, the patient comprehends this, they've completed their education and they've gone through a process. Um, optimally, there's two-way communication. And again, the system is able to do that to actually uh, retrieve information from the uh, electronic health record, patient demographics, and particular and other potential information. For example, uh, diagnosis codes, um, mm. ICD-10 codes, etc., to just make the system more efficient uh, for the healthcare team. Okay. 
and going along with that, uh, with measuring uh, things, um, why is it important to track patient viewing and measure comprehension? As, as we say in medicine, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Um, and so one of the, the issues that we find in, uh, you know, in the front lines of healthcare is that even when patients are given information, they're told, hey, we need you to go to this website, or we need you, we're giving you a brochure or a document, we want you to read this before your procedure so you understand what's going to happen, is that the utilization of those resources is, is really uh, very small. And in fact, if people are going to uh, do their own research or do some homework, so to speak, to educate themselves, before an intervention or a hospital visit, uh, you know, or, or even a diagnostic test, if they are gonna do that, many times it's done just by simply Googling. And so what they, the information they get may not be accurate or may not be applicable to them. Um, there's a wide variety of quality of information available on the internet. Uh, some is, and the majority, quite honestly, let me put it this way, is, is poor. It does not meet, um, does not meet uh, institutional uh, requirements for for quality, high quality education, and it also may not be in, in the appropriate languages, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important when you're providing information to a patient that there's a way to know that they actually have um, viewed it, they have read it, and they've taken it in. And it's equally important to doc to measure and document that they actually comprehended what they were given. Now, this from a medical legal standpoint is critical, um, but also from a care standpoint, this is very, very important um, for managing patient expectations, for preparation before surgery to prevent cancellations, uh, to prevent no-shows, and also as a follow-up to make sure that, that the individual patient would have the resources uh, when, they, when they leave the hospital uh, or leave the, the physician's office or whatever setting they're in to be able to, to actually be in compliance with the recommendations uh, of their healthcare team. Um, again, ultimately, this, uh, there is a return on investment for an organization that was to measure, was to provide the appropriate educational material and then measure it and act on it from the standpoint of decreasing hospital readmissions and, and again, decreasing those no-shows and cancellations because patients weren't properly prepared, while also increasing, you know, patient loyalty and um, protecting themselves from risk, mitigating risk um, due to communication errors, which as we showed before is a major source of uh, medical malpractice um, suits in the United States. Very good. Well, um... I think we're reaching about the end of our time here. Do you have a, a contact slide there? Oh, yes, let me go ahead. Uh, yes, we have a contact slide here. If you have any questions um, about uh, the talk about shared decision-making, informed consent, um, or uh, solutions that are available uh, to address those issues and address patient education and engagement, uh, I can be reached uh, directly at, at my email here, john at rationalsurgicalsolutions.com. Um, and also we have a website uh, at ratify.com, R-A-T-I-F-I.com, uh, where you can uh, connect with us and also get more information on that product. Great, great. And did you have any uh, final advice for us or, or thoughts? Well, yes. Um, you know, as again, there's more emphasis being placed on shared decision making. Um, it's a it's a really valuable approach to healthcare and and quality healthcare for patients. Um, even though it may initially seem like more work for organizations to adopt this this mindset and this approach, uh, the return on investment is significant, um, all the way from financial to uh, patient outcomes and patient experience. Um, and so uh, I think uh, it's important that healthcare organizations and individual healthcare practitioners uh, really uh, embrace this. And uh, there are tools available to make this an easy, uh, you know, an easy adaptation and easy implementation of a new new approach to healthcare. Okay, great. 
Well, thank you so much for, for joining us today here at First Healthcare Compliance on our webinar series. I really appreciate it, Dr. Fialkov. And um, thank you so much attendees for joining us as well. And please use the contact information on the screen if you have any questions, or if you send us questions, we'll forward them on. Please remember your PACOM CEU certificate will be emailed to you from PACOM within two days following the broadcast. There's no need to request it. You can register for any future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at firsthcc.com or call us at 888-543-4778. And thank you for joining us.